This is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting. Good evening. The post-challenger returned to space, Act 2. The crew of Shuttle Atlantis roared up into orbit today and got down to business. Classified U.S. Defense Department business, still just about everyone, including the Soviets, are well aware that the all-military shuttle crew will deploy a half-billion-dollar new-generation spy satellite. CBS News correspondent Bruce Hall reports on the not-so-secret mission and the high-visibility blast-off. We have a go for main engine start. Seven, With less than 90 six, seconds left in the launch window, NASA waived the requirement of good weather at an emergency landing site, and Atlantis blasted off. And lift off. Atlantis begins another space voyage as it clears the tower. The shuttle rose majestically from the seaside launch pad, rolling to the northeast, heading up the coast, paralleling the eastern seaboard. It's a very clean ascent for Atlantis. The clear blue skies and unusual trajectory provided some of the best pictures ever of the solid rocket boosters burning out and plummeting toward the Atlantic. The crew of Atlantis has been given a go for orbit operations. That cleared the astronauts to begin checking out their super secret LaCrosse spy satellite. Tomorrow the huge spy in the sky will be unfolded and the shuttle will fly alongside it for several orbits making certain it is working. The satellite will be capable of scanning 80% of the Soviet Union, keeping track of military movements, and providing target information for the new stealth bomber. So the more we know about that, the more reassurance we have, the less the risk there is of nuclear war. Exactly when the spy satellite will be operational is still a secret. But the moment the 10,000-watt radar is turned on, the Soviets will be tracking the largest radar beacon ever seen in the sky and the U.S. astronauts could be coming home as early as Monday. Bruce Hall, CBS News, Kennedy Space Center. A bizarre hijacking came to a peaceful end today in Israel. We now know it began yesterday when a group of armed Soviets commandeered a busload of schoolchildren and their teachers in southern Russia. The gunmen swapped the hostages for a plane, and for reasons that are still a mystery, they forced it to fly to Israel. There, as CBS News correspondent Bob Simon reports, the hijackers surrendered their weapons, themselves, and sacks filled with money. Accompanied by Israeli warplanes, the Aleutian 76, assigned flight number 000, touched down at Ben Gurion Airport. 000, welcome to Israel. What is uh, the purpose of your coming to Israel? Uh, first, uh, we are first to land. The Soviet crew of eight was taking orders from five hijackers. Bandits, said the Israelis, armed with four pistols and a sawed-off shotgun. 35 minutes after touchdown... The whole incident has ended. Hours earlier, the army had taken over the airport. It was as unusual for the Israelis to let a hijacked plane land here as it was for the Russians to let one take off. But Israeli leaders, eager to re-establish relations with Moscow, were delighted to grant a direct, official Soviet request. The Soviet pilot seemed delighted to be in the Holy Land. He said after they landed, the hijackers wanted to know if this was Israel or Syria. If it's Israel, they said, we stay. There's little doubt, though, that they will be sent back to the Soviet Union without the satchels they were carrying full of cash. How much money, General? A lot. How much? Two million, Two million. Two million. Two million dollars. dollars. American Rubles. dollars. American dollars. The entire Israeli command was on hand, happy to be involved in a drama having nothing to do with Palestinians. But Defense Minister Rabin was there to make sure the Russians were not entirely let off the hook. I must admit that I can't understand how they could manage to leave the Soviet Union without the Soviet authorities doing anything to prevent it. Israeli officials find it ironic and amusing that it took some common criminals and a hijacking to bring the first Aeroflot flight to Tel Aviv in more than 20 years. Bob Simon, CBS News, Ben Gurion Airport. The UN General Assembly voted today to move out of New York temporarily because the Reagan administration has refused to allow the head of the PLO to come here. Richard Schlesinger has our report. It was almost unanimous. 154 nations voted in favor of moving the United Nations General Assembly session to Geneva in order to hear an address by PLO Chairman Yasser Arafat. Washington has refused to issue Arafat a visa to come to New York, and the U.S. voted against moving to Geneva. But only Israel joined the American representative in voting late this afternoon. 
The PLO has not abandoned terrorism. The nature of the PLO has not changed. The debate over the resolution to move the General Assembly session reflected the deep divisions of the Mideast conflict as Arab states attempted to stop the Israeli attack on the PLO. The statement now delivered by the representative of the settler Zionist entity has absolutely no relationship with the item under consideration in the General Assembly. Today's action followed earlier votes in the world body, asking the U.S. to change its mind and issue Arafat a visa. The U.S. lost big in those votes, too. Ironically, Washington will have to pay for its policy in cold cash. The move will cost about $650,000, and according to a U.N. formula, the U.S. will get a bill for about one quarter of the cost. And, Dan, that bill will include the cost of flying 40 diplomats to Geneva, first class. The State Department uh, said late today it stands by its decision to deny Arafat the visa. Secretary of State Schultz said earlier this week he believes he's sending a message against terrorism by his refusal to allow Arafat to come here. But when Arafat speaks in Geneva, the U.S. will be represented. Dan? Thanks, Richard. Have a good weekend. Thanks. A panel of the International Civil Aviation Organization has reportedly concluded the Iranian airliner shot down last summer over the Persian Gulf by U.S. warship had only about 40 seconds direct warning before it was attacked. The Canadian press quoted the aviation panel as confirming U.S. claims that several warnings were in fact issued to the Iranian plane, but only one warning was coded specifically for Iran Flight 655. That warning, the aviation panel says, came just 40 seconds before the flight was hit by a U.S. missile, killing 290 people on board. At their New York meeting next week, President Reagan and President-elect Bush are expected to press Gorbachev for movement on a conventional weapons deal. That was a key concern of NATO defense ministers who wrapped up a two-day meeting in Belgium today. CBS News correspondent Bill McLaughlin was there. America's European allies today pledged to do more to pay their share for the defense of the West. U.S. Secretary of Defense Frank Carlucci was pleased with a NATO report. They unanimously approved the report that makes clear some of their nations are not bearing a fair share of the common defense burden. The Allies also joined the U.S. in calling on the Soviet Union and its allies to scale back their massive conventional force advantage in new arms reduction talks. We really direct our defense efforts according to the potential of the other side. And Gorbachev did not reduce the potential so far. He did not reduce by one tank or one man. We will offer him the opportunity during the conventional stability talks. The problem is that Moscow behaves as if NATO and the Warsaw Pact forces are roughly equal. Making military uh, doctrines on both sides truly defensive and going for uh, substantial uh, reductions in arms forces doesn't just depend on the Soviet Union. But the Western allies say it does. Declassified NATO statistics show that the Soviet Union and its allies in Eastern Europe can field almost five times as many tanks and armored cars as NATO, about three times as many artillery pieces, more than twice as many combat aircraft and helicopters, and has more than a million more troops to use all that hardware. What prevents the establishment of truly normal relations between East and West is this tremendous conventional force overhang which the Soviets have vis-à-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, NATO. The Europeans hope their pledge to share the financial burden will silence voices in Congress demanding U.S. troop cuts in Europe to help shave the budget deficit. Bill McLaughlin, CBS News, Brussels. And still to come on the Friday, CBS Evening News, Susan Spencer on a disturbing new study of secondhand smoke. And Bob McNamara on a snow-softened, hard-sell Yellowstone Park after the fires. A billion dollar cleanup job at a nuclear weapons processing plant in Ohio. CBS News Defense Department correspondent David Martin reports on a first of a kind federal agreement, a post election agreement to settle all claims, end the cover up, and begin the cleanup after the plant secretly released radioactive dust for years. Today is making legal history. For the first time, a federal Department of Energy facility will operate under a strict court judgment requiring them to comply with all state and federal hazardous waste laws and, and uh, regulations. The facility is the now notorious uranium processing plant at Fernald, Ohio, 
part of the complex which makes this country's nuclear weapons. For decades, the Department of Energy knew the plant was contaminating the environment, but kept it secret. After four years of legal maneuvering, a federal judge today gave the state of Ohio a measure of revenge, ordering the Department of Energy to pay $1 million, a relatively modest settlement, but a major victory. Four years ago, when I was with Ohio EPA, we couldn't even gain access to these sites to see what the problems were. More important than the money is the judge's ruling that the plant must now clean up its operations. Some residents remain skeptical. How long they've been saying it? Hey. They're going to try and clean it up or they're going to close it down. Not until I see it done. Others seem more willing to forgive. If our government makes mistakes and they admit it, then I think I respect my government a little bit more. Added to the million dollar settlement, the Department of Energy will also foot the bill for cleanup. A price tag estimated at one billion dollars. That's just a fraction of what it would cost to correct safety and health problems throughout the nuclear weapons complex. We would estimate it anywhere probably between 120 to 170 billion dollars. Over? Over probably a 40 year lifetime. In today's settlement, the Department of Energy did not admit it was guilty of breaking the law. That means that although today's action was a first, it does not set a precedent that can be used by other people attempting to sue the Department of Energy. David Martin, CBS News, Washington. You know, for years there's been debate between smokers and non-smokers. How dangerous is it to breathe someone else's smoke? The word from researchers tonight, perhaps far more dangerous than just about anyone suspected. CBS News medical correspondent Susan Spencer reports. A startling new study finds that not only can breathing secondhand smoke cause cancer in non-smokers, it also can cause heart disease. That in fact, 32,000 non-smokers each year die of heart disease caused by other people's smoke. Lung cancer is important in passive smoking, but heart disease is probably far more important. If someone smokes around you, they're poisoning you. There's no question about it. The report, published today in the magazine Environment International, puts the total number of deaths from involuntary smoking at 46,000 a year, just slightly below the number of people who die on the highways. Of that total, it estimates nearly two-thirds are from heart disease. We all suspected it would be of the order of thousands of deaths a year, but 32,000 deaths a year was a surprise. What isn't clear is how involuntary smoking causes heart disease. One theory, when non-smokers inhale secondhand smoke, tiny particles are absorbed into the bloodstream. Those particles can damage cells on the artery walls, leading to blockages. It takes a long time, probably, to develop these diseases, but every little increment adds to the risk. And this study will add to calls for more restrictions. Along with the national ban on smoking on short airline flights, 42 states now have some restrictions on smoking, everywhere from hospitals to city buses. Five years ago, people thought passive smoking was a nuisance. It made your clothes stink, maybe. It maybe gave you a headache. But this is clearly identifying it as one of the major public health problems in this country today. Not surprisingly, the Tobacco Institute disagreed, predicting, perhaps with its fingers crossed, that this study will be laughed out of the scientific community. Susan Spencer, CBS News, Washington. Five Cubans who committed crimes in this country after coming here in the 1980 Mariel boat lift were sent home today. They're the first to be deported under a deal that touched off riots last year among Cubans held in several U.S. prisons. Earlier today, the U.S. Supreme Court denied a request by three of the five to block their deportation. find Fieldmaster wool blend sports shirts in lots of great looking plaids. Durable and machine washable. Find these and more for just $13.88. Only at Sears. Michael Dukakis went to Washington today. He accepted an invitation to meet privately with George Bush. For the president-elect, this caps a series of meetings aimed at softening lingering effects of negative campaigning. CBS News National Affairs correspondent Leslie Stahl has our report. George Bush is trying to make sure he gets a honeymoon, and his biggest let's make up gesture came today when he welcomed, like an old friend, the man who only weeks ago he excoriated as a soft on crime, soft on defense, Massachusetts liberal. It's been most pleasant, and I am very grateful to him for the spirit of this visit. Well, I'm anxious to cooperate and, and to 
play a constructive role. Still, Dukakis didn't seem quite ready to forget. We've been cleaning Boston Harbor up for four years with very little help from this administration. Michael Dukakis, who touched many bases in Washington today, may harbor resentments about the campaign, but the Democrats who won and are returning to Congress seem more than eager to let bygones be bygones. The American people do not want uh, whatever bad feelings took place in the election to be carried on into the government of the United States in the coming years. The transition, it's been a parade of photo ops, highly visible, symbolic, Mr. Bush extending a hand of friendship. How can the Democrats and other adversaries not respond in kind? When the election's over, it's over. It's, we're not seeking just to eliminate nastiness. We're seeking to build understanding. There are those who think Mr. Bush's moves are calculated and cynical. Chop up to win, cozy up to govern. I don't think this is a media hype, but I think he's laying the groundwork not only for the honeymoon, but for good relations, people to people, when times get tough. And if there's any doubt that Mr. Bush's personal touches are working with the Democrats, listen to this. Courtesy, civilities, trying to smooth over these difficulties, they're not everything, but they're important. They're noticed, they're appreciated, and they're responded to. No one is suggesting the country's problems will be any easier to solve. Come January, when Mr. Bush has to tackle the intractable issues like the deficit, he'll find out just how much good personal relationships count. Leslie Stahl, CBS News, Washington. The government today said that in spite of the creation of more than 460,000 new jobs in November, the nation's civilian unemployment rate inched up one-tenth of one percent. The jobless rate now stands at 5.4 percent overall. This report says 62.6 percent of the population age 16 or older held some kind of job last month, and that's a record. South Africa's white minority government released one of its most vigorous opponents from detention today, a journalist, a black newspaper editor, held without trial since December of 1986. But while he is out of jail now, Martha Teichner reports, the newspaper man is not a free man. Zwolaki Sisulu was released today after two years in jail without being charged with any crime. He was South Africa's most prominent political detainee. His release is the latest in a rapid succession of significant human rights gestures by the South African government, believed to be aimed at easing international anti-apartheid pressure. But Sisulu's freedom is severely restricted. He's not supposed to be in the presence of 10 persons. So please move back. At a news conference, Wallachi Sisulu sat silently, not permitted to speak, while his lawyer read out the list of his restrictions. He must report to police twice daily, he cannot go out at night, and he cannot work as a journalist. Zwolaki Sisulu was editor of The New Nation, an anti-apartheid newspaper. Three years ago, he won a journalism fellowship to Harvard University. Inside South Africa, the Sisulus rank with the Mandela family, among the country's best-known anti-apartheid leaders. Zwolaki Sisulu's father, Walter, was sentenced to life in prison with Nelson Mandela in 1964. Albertina Sisulu, like her son Zwolaki, is under similar restrictions as a result of her own activist politics. But tonight at the Sisulu home, restrictions were forgotten. There was only the joy of family reunion and the hope that the South African government is leading up to freeing Walter Sisulu and then Nelson Mandela himself. Martha Teichner, CBS News, Johannesburg. Partially American-educated, Benazir Bhutto was sworn in today as Prime Minister of Pakistan. She's the first woman leader of a Muslim nation. She promised to, quote, heal the wounds left by 11 years of military rule as the country resumes its experiment with democracy. Bhutto also pledged to seek better relations with China, the Soviet Union, and the United States. The new Canon SureShot Ace with remote control puts you in your own pictures where you ought to be. You ought to be in pictures. You're wonderful to see. You ought to be in pictures. Oh, what a hit you would be. You ought to be in pictures. Your face would be adored. You ought to be in pictures. The new Canon SureShot Ace with remote control. So advanced, you get in on the fun. My folks just left. Thank 
The Subaru Justy gets you anywhere you want to go, less expensively than any other four-wheel drive car. Mr. Potts, you're home. Of course. What brings you out on a night like this, James? Up to $1,000 cash back from Subaru means a great deal on a great... <laughs> Time for a quick break and one of my favorite quick snacks, Sunsweet Fitted Prunes. Surprised? I don't know why. They're good for you and they're delicious. Hmm. Rounder, plumper, sunsweet. There's only one place you'll find a sale this big for appliances and electronics, where every microwave, every VCR, TV, and more is 5 to 30% off. Now, only at Sears. Last May 24th, lightning cracked a tree near Rose Creek in Yellowstone National Park. The fire that followed quickly died down, but 20 other fires in the country's oldest national park did not. And through the summer, millions here and abroad saw horrifying pictures on television as much of the park literally went up in flames. Now nature is healing some of the scars. But what's left for tourists to see in Yellowstone? Bob McNamara had the enviable assignment of looking into that. At Yellowstone National Park, the only fire now burns in the cold evening sky. Today, the winter snows have softened the ravages of the worst forest fires here in several centuries. And though the blazes scarred almost half of the park's more than two million acres, the wildlife, the elk, and the bison still winter here. The great geyser basins keep steaming, and Old Faithful still boils. We need to reassure folks that uh, Yellowstone is still here, that it's uh, alive and well, that it's significantly improved in many ways. While in Denver today, written reviews of Yellowstone firefighting efforts told of confusion, inexperience, and slow reactions, review board members downplayed mistakes. When the decisions were being made, those decisions were, were good, given the conditions that they knew and the conditions that they faced. Though the summer fires badly singe the park's public image, Yellowstone and the states around it have lost little time campaigning the world to show that the place that millions love is not lost. In London this week, a travel show saw Yellowstone tour promoters trying to douse notions the park is in ruin. Was there any actual damage to the hotel facilities? Uh, very little. Selling Yellowstone's new look now includes a video. Firestorms. Produced for the travel industry, the film portrays the fires but sells the untouched attractions. More than a hundred million tourist dollars could be lost to Wyoming and Montana if people don't see the park coming back. Courting the most lucrative travel market, this week Japanese tour officials saw firsthand the fire's effects. 100 to 200 years, we should have a fairly big forest again. But awed by the wildlife and the spectacle of Old Faithful, the Japanese promised to sell the park at home. All indications are that people are anxious to come to Yellowstone and see for themselves what has happened. Still, despite all that's been preserved here, polls disagree over whether visitors really will come back in vast numbers. It's a time of wonder in Yellowstone now, and a time of worry and wait. Bob McNamara, CBS News, Yellowstone National Park. And that's the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather, Bob Schieffer will be here tomorrow. I'll see you again Monday. Good night. This is CBS. Every year, generous Houstonians share the spirit of the holiday.